Check, check, one, two. Very nice, nice. Okay. It's about time to get started. Let's go ahead and get our home recording studio basics part two underway. All right, there we go. Hey, what's going on, my friends? And hello to my fellow veterans as well. My name is Trevor Meyer. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Warrior Beat and a former Navy corpsman. And I am also a professional producer, composer, and audio engineer. So thank you for joining me again for part two of our Home Recording Basics series. So uh, had a great time last week. I noticed we've been getting a lot of... Uh, Great views on our YouTube page, which uh, is fantastic. I'm glad to see that people are uh, interested, you know, in taking advantage of all this great technology we have to uh, learn how to create their own music. Because I personally, you know, find a great deal of satisfaction, even just uh, from the standpoint of um, a hobbyist, you know, of being able to record and create my own music for personal enjoyment. And so little recap of last week it was funny I was uh, you know going over last week's video and session and uh, I sure talked about foam a lot I, de <laughs> I definitely have a thing for studio foam I think that's probably from uh, years of being in uh, untreated rooms and uh, you know thinking to myself one of these days I'm gonna have studio foam and that day has finally arrived and uh, so I'm gonna mention it one more time studio foam at the foam <laughs> So just a quick rec uh, recap of last week, what we talked about. And last week was really about um, just kind of getting things set up. You know, what are the different components that you need to uh, set yourself up for uh, successful home recordings? And we just talked about room treatment. Again, getting your room set up. That's where the, the foam was mentioned 100,000 plus times. And, you know, where do we set up our speakers? What's good placement for our monitors? You know, and... Uh, you know, the kind of computer, laptop, introduction to microphones, different types of cables we're going to use. And uh, this week we're going to put some of that stuff into action. And again, this is kind of a, a more informal session. You know, I'm just here in my own little home studio. And uh, today what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to record some acoustic and electric guitar. And we're going to use that as the basis to learn about uh, microphone placement and the different types of mics we can use to record these instruments and then getting into the software and uh, kind of get the ins and outs of what are the different plugins you know that we're going to use when we're mixing uh, for example compression EQ uh, reverb is another really those are kind of like the three the three big ones compression EQ and reverb uh, that you're going to use quite a bit. And I'll even pull up some of the more fun uh, effects that, uh, again, come with a lot of the different programs that we're going to uh, be using. And again, I am a, a PreSonus Studio One user. I use Studio One 5 Professional Edition. Uh, great thing about, one of the great, uh, many great things about Studio One is the... Um, 
you can uh, it's called PreSonus Sphere. And if you're a Sphere member, it's like fourteen dollars a month, and you get everything that uh, PreSonus makes. PreSonus is the manufacturer of uh, Studio One, and so you're going to get all the different software instrument plugins. You're going to get all the different uh, mixing plugins, uh, all kinds of great loops, all kinds of great sound sets, and uh, at a very uh, e easy monthly cost. You know, you could pay five hundred dollars for the boxed edition of Studio One Five Professional, or, and then have to pay for upgrades. You know, on a yearly basis, or you just pay fourteen dollars a month, and not only do you get the best recording software, in my opinion, but you get all the different bells and whistles that really make it uh, a powerhouse production suite. And you also get the notation software called Notion, uh, which I'll probably get into way, way down the line. It's not a uh, software program I use that often, but it's where you can actually take and enter in musical notation in like a score setting. That way, if you are a composer or conductor and you need to print out scores, or if that's your preferred method of composing, they have a whole bunch of tools that are included in the PreSona Sphere program that you can use uh, for that as well. And again, a lot of the things that we talk about in the basic program, they're going to uh, be exactly the same whether you're using uh, PreSona Studio One 5, whether you're using Pro Tools, Logic, or even one of the most popular um, DAW softwares is uh, GarageBand, you know, which comes on a lot of the Apple products, the iPhone and the iPad, uh, for example, and that usually comes free. So a lot of people are taking advantage of that and uh, using that software. So all the basics that we're going over are going to apply to any different software program you choose. And again, I just I choose Studio One for uh, a host of reasons. <clears throat> it's very user friendly. You know, I come at this uh, the recording side of things as a musician first. So um, back when I was learning production, uh, when I was living in New York City, you know, I <clears throat> I wanted software that intuitively worked for me as a musician. I didn't want to spend months and months learning all kinds of t you know, complicated routings and all this stuff. And uh, I found that uh, the Studio One program is just so user-friendly. You just drag something and drop it in there, and psh, it pulls right up. And we're going to get into that today. <clears throat> so, yeah, so hopefully that... Uh, uh, last week, over this past week, you may be able to maybe make some adjustments in your own studio. And again, you don't have to spend, a g this program is designed for a more budget-friendly uh, studio experience, you know, the budget-friendly musician. You don't have to spend tens of thousands of dollars uh, to get very uh, high-quality home recordings. Not, you know, that's not the case at all. Just making some sm uh, a few minor tweaks, as we've talked about, uh, can make a huge difference. And again, some of the most important tweaks are going to be making sure you have a soft surface behind your mix area on the front wall, <clears throat> making sure your monitor speakers are at least one foot off the wall, and then making sure the back wall in your mix position also has a soft surface. Because last week we talked about uh, what's called room reflections. And that's basically where sound waves are going to reflect off all the different surfaces in your room. And um, the best, m the most affordable way, I think, to deal with room ref reflections is through foam. Uh, or soft surfaces. And again, if you don't want to spend even like $50 on a foam panel, if you go to you know any budget store or you, maybe uh, you have some extra blankets around the house, it's just you know maybe stapling up some blankets on the back wall or setting up like a little system where you can just hang some blankets, you know, take some thicker pillows and put them in the corners to deal with base reflections and base buildup. Um, again, if you have a couch, you know, and you're setting up your cool little mixing space and you want a place where your, your friends or artists come over and check out your mixes, you know, just putting a couch behind where you sit, that's going to eat up those bass frequencies real quick and easy, and it functions as a place to sit or chill, you know, during sessions. It's always good to take naps when you start to get ear fatigue. And I don't know if I mentioned that last week, you know, we talked about, you know, the importance of having a good set of monitors. When we're picking out our speakers, we want something that's going to give us accuracy, uh, which is a flatter frequency response. We don't want the speakers exaggerating frequencies when we're trying to mix. A lot of st like traditional stereo speakers or home theater systems, you know, they're going to have EQ bumps at certain frequencies to give things more impact, especially like bass and rumble and clarity. Uh, we want speakers that cut that out so we're able to hear exactly how the EQ is functioning uh, in our mix. And um, we also talked about, you know, if you do want to invest a little more money and not put foam up all over the room, there's uh, 
diffracting is another method uh, and deflecting so you can get these acoustic deflectors and uh, put those behind and stuff and again putting something above your mix position just where you're sitting that's going to stop sound waves from reflecting down because when you're in your mix position and we'll see you get the side view here you know this is where I'm going to sit and so I got my speakers they it forms a triangle and so the woofer cone and the tweeters on my speakers, what I want to do is make sure that they're aimed so they will come together and the point of that triangle is going to meet right here behind my head. And that is the ultimate mix position. And we want to make sure that this area right around us is not getting all those you know, acoustic reflections. And that's going to help you make better, more accurate decisions when you're working on your mixes. So again, it's just a few minor treatments and maybe you don't have any acoustic treatment at all huge difference just getting those speakers at least a foot off your off off the wall that's what makes a big difference and then decoupling them from the surface you know i have them on the second tier on my desk but as you can see they're on these uh big foam rubber pad thingies that uh, decouple them from the surface so there's no vibrations coming off the desk with the speakers and again that just improves the accuracy of the speaker <coughs> itself Another way to completely eliminate the room is just getting headphones, you know, getting yourself a nice pair of headphones. Again, I love Biodynamic. I've been using them for years. Um, and for when I'm mixing, I use a set of open back headphones, meaning that they're ventilated. So I'm not getting all those sound pressure levels built up directly on my ears. And you get more uh, spatial sense and uh, bass representation as well with an open back set. Or you can also use, when you're tracking, you're going to use something more like a closed back headphone, meaning there's no ventilation at all. And they're good for tracking, uh, especially when you have an open mic source, like you're uh, using a uh, condenser microphone on an acoustic guitar recording a vocal. You don't want what's going on in the headphones bleeding into the mic. So you use a set of closed back headphones as opposed to open. And so again, today, what we're going to be getting into are just some really... Uh, what I consider the nuts and bolts of recording, uh, recording an acoustic guitar, miking up this little amplifier, got the little pig nose out today. And then uh, we're also going to be doing uh, just an introductory uh, lesson on making beats because a lot of people, a lot of younger artists that uh, work in some you know, more modern genres of music, anywhere from EDM, hip hop, you know, beat making is a, it's a really fun and, and actually, it can be a very lucrative way to do things right from your home. You know, people are always buying beats. And so we're going to get into what, you know, what's what's an easy way to make beats. I'm going to be using the drum machine uh, called Impact that comes with the uh, PreSonus software. And we'll go into the basics of what, you know, making a beat's like. And we're going to take it all the way from the MIDI and recording it to mixing it down. But I think for today, the best place to start is going to be recording an acoustic guitar. And we're going to talk about, you know, again, we went over the different types of mics, uh, dynamic microphones and condenser microphones, large diaphragm condenser microphones. Today we're going to get uh, out the little uh, small diaphragm uh, or pencil condensers, as they're often referred to as. And we're going to mic up this uh, awesome acoustic guitar here. Got the Guild out today. And um, I'll just show you some different techniques for miking up an acoustic guitar. We'll use a two mic setup, and we'll also just use a one mic setup. A lot of times maybe you don't have the luxury of having two mics. Well, that doesn't mean you can't get an amazing recording, you know, just using one condenser microphone. I've done that a lot. And we'll also be talking about uh, double tracking as well. I like to double track acoustic guitars. I'm going to show you how that gets you a lot fuller sound. So step one in miking your acoustic guitar is having an acoustic guitar. So I got the Guild here today, and it's funny is when we t you know talk about getting these great sounds, one of the things that's so often overlooked is the instrument itself. You know, you could have a world-class microphone, a, an amazing uh, audio interface like I have here with the PreSonus Quantum 2626. We'd be recording at 192K in a perfectly foamed room, and your acoustic guitar can still sound crappy. Why is that? Well, maybe you didn't tune it, and maybe you haven't changed the string in a couple of years. So I just changed the strings on the Guild yesterday. Uh, for today's lesson and so the first thing I'm going to do when I'm getting ready to record an acoustic guitar and again you don't always have to ch change the strings before a session a lot of times that'll be up to the preference of the guitar player if you're working with one or if it's you it's your preference so I changed out my strings and uh, on my phone I have a 
the app I will recommend. And again, all the all the things that I recommend using over in this home recording series are nothing is a, a paid endorsement. I don't get paid by any of these companies, unfortunately. Uh, if I recommend it, it's because I use it, and it's because it's very cost effective. And so this app, Guitar Tuna, is a free app. And of course, you can pay. A little bit extra, or like two bucks a month if you want extra features like tuning ukuleles and stuff. Well, I don't use that, so I just use the free version of it, and I have it set to standard tuning. And I just set it down here, and I'm just going to go through and make sure that first and foremost, my guitar's in tune. Sure is <coughs> beautiful. So now we got the ch you know new strings on it, so we're gonna get the crispest, fullest sound we can. You know our guitar is in tune, and so how are we gonna mic up an acoustic guitar? You know there's all kinds of ways that you can do it, and I'm just gonna go over a couple of the uh, more traditional methods of doing it. And I'm gonna start out first by just using a single large diaphragm condenser mic, which I have sitting over here. And again, I love Rode microphones. They're made in Australia. And uh, just it's a great company, and they build incredible microphones at, uh, at just such a budget. I mean, it's they're budget-friendly, but, man, I mean, they sound like much more expensive mics. And so um, this is the uh, NT1A, and it's like $229. Sounds fantastic on acoustic guitars. Sounds fantastic on brass instruments or percussion. And it's also just a great vocal microphone as well. It's a solid state mic, meaning there's no, it doesn't use a tube to get its power source. And so what I'm going to be doing today, this is, this is where I deviate a little bit from my normal routine. Um, for some reason, when I'm doing live streams, I can't run everything into the quantum. So I'm going into my Zoom L12, which is what we use. Warrior Beat uh, uh, does get a lot of support from Zoom. So I'm always happy to showcase Zoom products. And so I'm using the L12 live track. And this also not only functions as a mixer, it, it also is a very cost-effective audio interface. And one thing I love about the Zoom products, especially the L12, the L8, and the L20, is that they have built-in compression, one knob compression on every channel. And when you're live streaming and you can... When you're, st when you're streaming and you're also the performer, having built-in compression is so nice because then you can set that and you know you're not going to overload uh, during a performance. Uh, but normally I wouldn't be going into the mixer and then into the interface. I would just be plugging into one of the microphone preamps on the Quantum. But uh, today, since I'm streaming it, we're going to use the L12, which is great because the preamps on the L12, the microphone preamps, sound fantastic. And I also love the sound of the compressor as well. Um, to me, it reminds me a lot of uh, Focusrite compression, and Focusrite compression, uh, it's another company that makes interfaces and uh, compression units, and they just, it's a very nice musical digital compression. And basically, you might be asking, well, hey, Trev, what's a compressor? So a compressor, uh, either outboard or, uh, I'll pull one up on the uh, the program here, so you can take a look and see what a software compressor looks like. Oops, no change the screen there we go so what's a compressor look like since I'm sitting here yakking about them compressor looks like this so I'm in the mixing page on uh, PreSonus Studio One and so this is the track page and these are all I'm going to close this out actually because this is uh, the music that was playing to start today's program don't want that I got an open blank file for today's session somewhere there we go. So I am going to open up, <coughs> and the first thing I'm going to do when I'm getting ready to record, and I'm pretty sure you can still see me up top <coughs> in the camera there, is uh, we're starting from scratch. We got a guitar. We got some good, decent strings on the guitar. They're all covered in rust and gook. We tuned our guitar. And uh, so what do we do next? So we open up a session, and for the PreSonus users, or if you might be interested in getting PreSonus, so I'm going to go ahead and just close out and start from scratch, show you how how to start from scratch. So when you open up Studio One, you know what, we'll go all the way scratch. I'm closing out everything. Okay, so what do we do to start? Okay, you know what, I want to record acoustic guitar. Okay, come down here. First thing I'm going to do is open up Studio One. 
So it's initializing, going through, making sure all those millions of little things that I have plugged in are plugged in and turned on. <laughs> and then this is kind of the, uh, they have a name for it. I should know what this page is called. It's like the, I just call it the opening page. So anyway, I'm going to create a new song. And these are all the songs I've been working on, all the different tracks, different projects I got going on. Um, and But for today, I just want to start something new. And again, it's showing me right here that I got my audio interface plugged in. I got the Quantum 2626 set at 96K for recording. And again, we talked about the different bit depths for recording. Uh, 44.1 is very common. <coughs> and then you can go all the way up now. At least at this moment, I'm pretty sure 192 is the highest. And again, it's going to come down to processing power and um, RAM and memory space, just physical storage space you have on your computer uh, computer unit is going to help, you know, make the decision on what to record at, you know. Can you get amazing sounding recordings at 44.1? Absolutely. You absolutely can. And you can get amazing sounding recordings all the way up to 192. And so when you want to choose, you know, I choose 96 because it's uh, it's a nice, it, the file is larger, but it's going to get me all the detail. And you just basically look at it as it's how many little pieces is it breaking down that recording as it's going into. The more pieces, the more detail. <coughs> and so I've got my interface set at 96, and it says 256 samples. Uh, this is the latency. So I didn't, I don't think I talked about latency last week, and that is uh, a, something that's huge in the record, especially in computer-based recording. Latency is something you always need to be aware of. And latency is basically the time it takes a signal going into your interface or preamp to actually get in through your computer, get in through all the stuff that you got it going through, and actually start to record. And so there's going to be a delay in time because nothing is absolutely instantaneous. And so the more stuff that you have going or the slower processors that you have, you know, the more latencies there, there's going to be. So I'm fortunate I can set my latency uh, very low. You know, I can set mine basically on the quant. That's the one thing that's amazing about these. All of this outboard gear is pre-Sonus. You know, I got the fader port, got the Atom SQ, got the monitor station V2 for my headphone mixes and monitor mixes, and the 2626 quantum interface that is uh, run via Thunderbolt. And uh, <coughs> the processing is so fast in these that you can set the latency basically down to nothing and not get any dropouts and or our audio uh, audio artifact. And a dropout is basically when you start, and I'll show you in a software instrument, is when you're playing a note or something and it starts, it literally drops out. Like the computer can't process it fast enough, so it's either... It either um, just completely craps out on you, or you get a lot of fuzz and distortion, and it sounds like crap. Uh, <clears throat> so that's an audio dropout, and that's going to happen if you have your latency set too low. So I got it set to 256, and, <clears throat> and I'll show you why when we open up the program what that means. So again, I'm going to go ahead and start a new song. Gives you all kinds of different templates here. You know, if you have a rock band, you know, and you hit this, it's going to come up with all these different tracks uh, for your drums, vocals, guitars, all that stuff. I just want to go with a blank tra uh, track. So I'm going to call this uh, Home Recording Session 2. And now here's one thing. And I had to learn the hard way, and hopefully uh, me telling you this will make you be more aware of it. File management is huge when it comes to computer-based recording. Properly naming your files, you know, setting up a folder system where you know where you're going to be able to find recordings. Because in the past, you know, I'm notorious for clogging up my C drive, which is where all your operating systems. You shouldn't be recording onto your C drive. Um, you just put operating programs, and like I have Studio One is installed on the C drive, but it records everything to my P drive, the program drive, <coughs> which I have, you know, specifically built into my uh, computer to record onto. That way, if your C drive gets too full of stuff, then your operating system, whether that be Windows or the uh, the Mac, what I don't even know what the iOS they're using, but your operating system is going to start to run all funky. Your computer's going to bog down. It's going to get slow, and that's a lot of people complain. Oh, it's like my computer's so slow. Well, you probably have a ton of stuff saved on your C drive, just like Trevor does all the time. Then has to call Warrior Beat Creative Director Ben Lehman and say, Ben, why, what's wrong? He's like, Let me see your C drive. Oh, it's full. So anyway. <coughs> 
file management is big, making sure that your uh, samples are on OneDrive, making sure that you're recording onto OneDrive, and that you know and properly label everything. So a lot of times what I'll be doing is like I'm working on something, I'll just randomly hit keys to name a, you know, name a track as I'm opening it up. And then a week later, I'm like, that was really cool. What was it? Well, I have 50 random wordless names for my songs, and it's like takes an hour to find what I want. So, you know, naming your song is important. Again, I got it going to the P drive, sample rate set at 96. And again, I can change that from 44.1 all the way up to 192, but I like 96. 64 bit float, you can also go from 16 bit CD quality. 64 bit is the best, and that's what my computer is equipped to do. Time base, meaning the structure of the song. I have it set up in bars, but I could do that in seconds, samples, or frames. If you're working uh, maybe on a film score and you want to actually be able to go with the different frames, you can do that as well. I like bars. Uh, I just arbit uh, arbitrarily picked a song length. I just have it set up for 20 minutes, so it gives me a really nice palette to work with. Uh, the metronome's uh, arbitrarily set to 90, and the time signature I'm going to set to 4-4. Four four. which is pretty pretty much the standard common 4-4 four, four time good. So now we have a fresh track here, complete open template. And so again, in the browse version, this is all the different um, software instruments, software effects, loops, my files. A great thing about Presona Sphere is it comes with a cloud membership. So if you have another friend maybe in another uh, city or state, especially during the social distancing times, uh, you can actually save these sessions to a cloud and you can be working on the same actual session together or you know it's like hey I just worked on a song it's up on the cloud okay I'm gonna add my guitar kind of thing and uh, it's just very convenient and PreSonus has just uh, integrated that right into the software pro uh, program which is great so these are all my different software instruments these are all the manufacturers and then uh, here's all the different keyboards I have etc and we're gonna work today uh, predominantly with PreSona stuff because this all comes with the uh, when I said if you sign up for Sphere and to get the software, Impact is the drum machine, Mai Tai is a very powerful synthesizer, Mojito is a very old school style synthesizer, Presence is kind of a catch-all software instruments that has everything from state-of-the-art orchestra software to pianos to drum sets to synthesizers. You know, you can pretty much, if you can think of the instrument, Presence probably has it. And Sample One is a very powerful sampling program, meaning you can take an audio file and start to manipulate it, cut it up, loop it, um, and that's a fun program as well. So those are your software instruments. Come over here to effects. I was talking about compression. Just wanted to show you what a compressor looks like. So the first thing I'm going to do, since I said I'm going to get ready to record an acoustic guitar, I am going to do a, I'm just going to use one mic for this time, and then I'm, and we're going to set up the a two mic setup after we do this, and then you can hear the difference. So I got my, my Rode NT1 large diaphragm condenser microphone. It's in its shock mount, so it's not going to vibrate. I got these nice, convenient little, uh, uh, microphone stands that aren't too, you know, uh, I'll show you some full-size ones, but this is nice for recording uh, hand percussion, for recording guitar amps, and recording acoustic guitars because it doesn't take up too much real estate. These are made by On Stage, and I like getting On Stage stands because they're usually the cheapest stand. And again, you do you get what you pay for. And in the past, I've had some problems with On Stage, but their new line of stands they've come out with are still really inexpensive and incredibly well built. So you know, I'm I'm an On Stage I'm an On Stage st uh, guy for sure. So the first thing I'm going to do when I pull up, I'm going to make an audio track. So I come up here to tracks. I'm going to add a track, and I want to add a mono track. So the difference, you could ma add an, a mono or a stereo track. Stereo track means it's going to be actually in stereo. It's going to be recording a left and a right separately. Either, so you either have to have a stereo mic or a two microphone setup. Since I'm only using one mic, one channel, that's going to be in mono. And I come up here to my inputs. And I just have it set up. Everything today is going into the L12 and then just going into channel 1 and 2 on the Quantum. So I have it set up for... It's coming in line 1. And this will be curious. I might have to change some things because, like I said, it's kind of uncommon for me to use this setup, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I have my, my proper input set up, my track's ready to go, and now what are we going to do? We're going to plug our microphone in. 
So again, we use an XLR cable to plug in a microphone. And since I'm going to be using a condenser microphone, remember a condenser microphone requires phantom power, which is basically a 48 volt uh, power that continuously goes to the mic to create the magnetic field that um, the diaphragm is, is in. <coughs> Get this cable out of the way. Another tip too. Um, File management is really important. So is cable management. And this is not the best example. It's a little bit cluttered right now. But managing your cables so you're not rolling over them, tripping over cables. You know, you trip over a cable that's plugged into your favorite microphone. Well, you just ruin your favorite microphone kind of thing. So, you know, you trip on the microphone. And next thing you know, it's ripping the, pre you know, the preamp right out of your interface. So, again, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to plug into... Let me just we'll go into channel one. Keep it simple. And so here on this, um, actually, I'm going to go into channel three, and I'll tell you why. So on this, I, again, I engage phantom power, and usually it's a red button on most interfaces. On the PreSonus, you can't see it, but it's a, a blue button. So now I turn that on, and phantom power is going to channel one, two, three, and four. And uh, turn down all my gains here pad is off good and then I plug my mic in and if you're <coughs> again the uh, three-pronged let me uh, come back to my screen here so you can see what I'm doing Keep forgetting I could change oh, does it just say Mike Ray is the whole time okay something's going on sorry about that <laughs> there we go okay so I got my condenser microphone. Again, it's going into a shock mount. Got my guitar tuned up. And so when you're plugging in your microphone, <coughs> it uh, the, th the side with the three prongs on it goes into your mixer or your preamp. So I'm going to go into channel three here. And again, then the side with the three holes, there's three prongs on your microphone. Boom. Just plug that in. So, and now, again, since we're using a condenser microphone, we're going to go ahead and turn on the phantom power. And I always wait and uh, make sure that the mic and everything is plugged in before turning on the phantom power. Uh, some microphones, you know, can, can be damaged if you're plugging it, you know, hot plugging it. So now I turn on my phantom power. And I can see, I turn up my gain. Already starting to get a little signal there. reverb on it. Other great thing about the, the L12 is it's got a lot of built-in effects. So for live streaming especially, it's awesome to be able to put reverb and compression on every channel. But I'm going to come over here. I don't want any effects. So I'm going to turn off all my effects on that. Make sure that everything is set nice and equal. Good, good, and good. Okay. So now I got my plugged in, my microphone. There we go. And so you could hear when I just picked that up, that rumble, you know, and again, that's what uh, a good shock mount is going to do is prevent that what we call handling noise. Don't want any handling noise. And so we come over here. And now so, you know, for the single microphone approach to miking an acoustic, what you want to do is... Uh, Get the diaphragm aiming right at your at the, the sound hole. And I'm looking on my mixer there, and it's coming in nice and hot. Not overloading, but it's a nice, strong signal. And you can kind of hear as I turn. That's where I'm getting my fullest sound. You don't want to come right on at it like that because, again, this is outputting air. So I come at it at a, sl a slight angle. And you can be, you know, maybe a good rule of thumb. You know, we're looking at about maybe a foot. Nine inches to a foot. Kind of the old 
thumb pinky method. I like that. And so again, I'm looking on my program now, and I'm going to arm my track just to get an idea of what my levels are. Let's see what's coming in there. Good. Check one, two. Okay, so it's uh, you can actually hear my voice in this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch my camera angle to the desktop. Hopefully I don't bump anything that will change that screen. But I want you to see the software. So we can see on track one, it's not, uh, and you can hear that my voice is doubled. It's because we're getting it through those two sources. We have the input monitoring on. So if I turn that off, now we're not hearing anything on that track. We're just hearing what's coming out of the mixer. But again, what I'm looking for... Good. Nothing's overloading. Nice strong signal, though. Let me uh, look at our different screens here. Come back to full cam. And so again, we can see that I'm sitting picky thumb. You know, that's going to be like a seven, seven to ten inches off there. Off-centered from the uh, the sound hole. And I like that. <clears throat> you know, and if you want to get a little more bass, then all you got to do is, you know, a little closer to it, a little less bass, you can get further away. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay, I like this right here. And so now what I'm going to do is I want to set a metronome. Now, unfortunately, that metronome is probably going to bleed through because, again, I'm using my open back headphones. <clears throat> but my closed back headphones are experiencing technical difficulties. Um, well, I guess there's no point in using a metronome. We don't have to. Um, again, a metronome is, or a click track, is we're going to hear that. And I'll show you what I mean by bleed. May as well. So I'm going to engage my click track. Come up here to our desktop view. And so we come down here, and this is where the uh, click tr uh, click is engaged here. Remember, this button here means I'm going to get a, w I've set it to do a one bar or a four count lead in. So I got my metronome all set up. And then. Yeah, see how, how loud that is? That's coming through the, the microphone because it's coming out of my headphones. So I'm going to turn that off. And we're just going to go ahead and record something very, very basic. Yep, something just like that. Nothing overloaded, which makes me happy. So I'm going to go ahead then. And if you don't have uh, the mixing thing like I do, the uh, control service, the fader port, you just come down here to your, uh, these are called your transport controls. So you got uh, rewind all the way, little rewind, fast forward a little bit, fast forward all the way, return to zero, stop, play, record, and loop all important functions. And so I'll hit record. And before I do, um, the other thing you want to kind of check since we're using an open microphone, again, you ideally have closed back headphones on. And then anything, again, this microphone is so sensitive, it's going to pick up stuff going on all over your house, basically. So again, that's where the acoustic treatment comes in. Uh, so not only is it preventing things from reflecting around your room, it's also preventing sounds from leaking into your microphone. So uh, I'm in the basement setup, so like I 
turned off the turn down the furnace kind of thing make sure there's no fans running if i'm doing laundry upstairs in the laundry room you know that's usually not the best time to uh, record because this microphone is so sensitive it picks up the rumble of the washer and the dryer you know and they're so sensitive if you if you got it, the gain on the microphone really turned up i can hear the mailman going by in his little truck so <coughs> but uh let's go ahead and just hit record so again we have that little pre-roll going in and now we can see that we are recording and we can see the sound waves coming up. And so I'm going to ahead and again just make sure I don't have anything overloading. Looks good. And I'm going to go ahead and just record some chords here. Actually, I'm going to start over again, and I'll tell you why. Here's a good uh, shortcuts. They're called on the keyboard to get good shortcut to remember. Control Z, Control Z, or it might be Command Z on a Mac. I have my headset mic on, so that's also picking up the acoustic in that. I don't want that. So what I'm going to do is turn off my headset mic. So we're just getting this one, and we'll start again. Just recording the road. That's it. There we go. Nice and full. Beautiful. Okay, so we just recorded our first track there. A mono, large diaphragm condenser microphone on our acoustic guitar. And, uh, and now that we're looking at the screen together, we can go back and... Uh, interesting phenomena we get in uh, modern recording is that it's not only can we mix and make decisions with our ears, but we can use our eyes too, because we have so much visual feedback uh, on our track. So I can see that uh, I got a nice, this is called a waveform, audio waveform. So we can see that I got a nice full waveform. Great thing about uh, PreSonus is like just by hitting Alt plus, I can increase the size of the waveform. Alt minus, I can make it smaller. And then kind of even just uh, at that point, bring it up to tastes. But I want to, uh, whoops, there we go. Go back to our original waveform. And that's how it recorded originally, without me messing with it. And so let's listen to the playback and see what we got here. Okay, so now there's me making noise. <laughs> Right, great. Okay, and so another important uh, keyboard shortcut that you're going to use is Control S, save. I just did all that work, and now I want to make sure that I save it because it's. I don't have it set to auto save. Um, I don't know why, but uh, you can set the program so like every 30 seconds or every two minutes, it just automatically saves. Um, I just try to remember to hit Control S, you know, after every time I do something. And so now we got our first mono acoustic track. And, and for me, that's my normal preference is going to be, let me switch back to different camera here. Get a sip of my refreshing Mountain Dew. Yeah, it looks like a mic in my crotch. 
Um, yeah, so for me, the preferred method of recording an acoustic guitar, I just like using one large diaphragm condenser microphone. Like I said, you know, within six to nine inches of the sound hole, slightly off-centered so it's not getting too much air pushed right at the diaphragm. <clears throat> and I just find that that gets the cleanest, fullest results. But we're also going to do one now using a stereo channel with two small diaphragm pencil condenser microphones. But before we do that, let's uh, <clears throat> talk about some of the uh, different aspects of the... Uh, the waveform that we just created. So let me switch back to our desktop cam here. And so again, really easy to zoom in and out. So this is what a waveform looks like at its tiniest. Great for making real precision editing. And so automatically I'm going to see <coughs> here that, you know what, I don't want any of this. This is just noise to me. So I can either come up here to these are my different uh, cursor tools. And I'll explain what they are as I use them. Uh, some of them I've, I rarely use, like these ones over here. Um, but this is the knife tool or the razor blade tool, and that's going to make a cut in your in your uh, track here. So now I went from having one solid track. Now I have two. I have this part and I have this part. And what I'm going to do is just delete that part. So now all that chair noise and all that stuff is at, it's just gone. Uh, you know, sometimes you can, uh, some people choose to use uh, filters and things like that to get those out. I just get rid of them. And then I bring it down to the smallest. I can, you know, and I come right up on it. Zoom in. And this is going to be right here is where my pick started to make contact. I want all this. And then what you want to do on an audio track is this is a fade right here. And again, what I love about PreSonus is it's so easy to do. You just, you know, you see it change to the finger. And that means I'm ready to put my fade in. I can really fade into it. So I'll let you hear what that sounds like. Hear how that... <coughs> That's way too aggressive. But what I want to do is just... There. Now, it's nothing is cut out because of the fade. Except if you don't put a fade in... That's hard to hear. Easier to hear when it's coming out, but you, you'll get a little art, uh, audio artifact, like a pop or a click, clicking sound, uh, when you don't put fades on and it, and it hits audio like that. So what I do is I just come right up, put my fade, and we're golden. So now, again, cooperate mouse, put my fade there. And so we'll get a nice, smooth start. Beautiful. And again, that fade didn't affect my guitar track at all. And uh, this isn't the best representation, probably, what you're hearing <coughs> on the speakers. Because I'm monitoring through so many different spots, and it's going from this to this to that. It's kind of weird, <laughs> the way we have things set up, unfortunately. The way we have to set things up when we're streaming. Um, normally, I would be monitoring directly out of my monitor station and using the Quantum 2626. Uh, but this is, again, this is just to give us a, a, a learning tool, not to show off the sound of this guitar. <coughs> but we can even hear just, uh, it's a very nice full sound. And so then we get into, again, we want to label our tracks. Instead of calling it track one, I'll call this. Acoustic LD, large diaphragm, so I know which mic I used, the acoustic LD. And then I look at the end of the track, too, and it depends how much fade out that I want. Getting it out by 18 will be just fine, because this is going to be my chair noise and fans and whatnot going. Uh, just a little side anecdote, when you talk about hearing, we'll just call it, you know, ambient noise, room noise, <coughs> in the the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, on the last track of that album, A Day in the Life, they uh, they loved that piano ring out. And uh, so maybe this can be some listening homework if you're 
uh, if you are a Beatles fan, it's always good to reconnect with the Sgt. Pepper album. If you're not a Beatles fan, maybe I can turn you on to one of the best bands in history, in my opinion. But at the end of Sgt. Pepper, on the song A Day in the Life, it has this great big build-up, and then boom, this big piano hit. And they just kept increasing the sound, you know, the uh, sensitivity of the microphone as the piano is fading out. And actually, you can hear the air conditioning system in Abbey Road Studios running at the end of that. You know, it's just... It's just kind of cool to hear, and they just left it in. You know, it's just kind of part of the part of the experience. Um, so let's go ahead now and just kind of take a look. Again, I'm going to show you how to set up the. Uh, I'm trying to decide what would be easier first. Well, let's look at some of the, the the three different types of effects that we're going to get into right away, and then I'll pull. I'll use the pencil condenser so we can kind of A B the two different uh, sounds we're going to get from using a small diaphragm, two mics, to the single. A large diaphragm condenser <coughs> and uh, so yeah so let's switch back to this view here so now I'm I'm satisfied okay I like the way that track sounded and um, since I'm just doing an acoustic track what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna you can now you can see you can drag this thing all over the place, you know. And again, this up here is our time format. This is in 4-4, so this is, you know, these are our measures. And so right now I have a four-bar intro of silence, so I don't need that. So I'm just going to drag this back here to two. And uh, good, so we got that. <coughs> And now let's look at some of the different effects that we can apply to this acoustic track to just start to learn what the effects are and how they work and how we can use them to enhance the sound of our recordings. And remember, again, in our track here, mute. I can actually show you in real time what these do. At least mute. Oh, can't hear. It's muted. <laughs> Soloing it doesn't do anything because it's the only track. <coughs> And uh, so this solos it. If I had five tracks here, when you hit solo, that means you're just going to hear this track here. Again, this is the arm track, which means it is now arm for recording. And this is the uh, monitor track, meaning we're hearing that input. That's why you suddenly heard my voice sound goofy, because we're hearing it through two different sources. So now I'm going to come over and I'm going to change my view in PreSonus. So I'm going to come a couple of different ways to do that. You can either just double click here. Now I got my mixer view and all the different uh, data associated with that and kind of set it up to taste. So now this is my fader and I'll only switch cameras to show you that it, it corresponds with this. <coughs> so we're seeing that uh, fader the the virtual fader in the mixer and then I can also control that here with this as well awesome <coughs> and again this is the PreSonus fader port my Atom SQ monitor station V2 all PreSonus products that kick butt so let's get back to our track session <coughs> And so again, I can either use my mouse to control that, or I can use, now I'm using that software controller, the fader port. Cool. The data up here, this is just showing exactly, as you can see, it's going up plus, minus, turning it down. Just going to leave it set at zero for now. Sometimes it can be so finicky. There it is, zero dB. <coughs> and now if we come over here, I'm going to close these different views. Um, so now th this is our master fader, and our master fader for s oh, because I was messing with it, um, it's going to by default be set at uh, zero decibels. You want to leave it at zero decibels. You know, it's usually a good rule of thumb that you just don't want to touch this fader because as you add tracks, you know, ev this everything eventually everything is going through this track. It's you know, what they call it sum through this track. And so if, you're, if your recordings are getting too loud and this is starting to overload, turning it down here isn't really going to do a whole lot. Yeah, it's going to make it so it's not overloading, but as we learn how to do multi-track mixing, I'll show you. Just by a rule of thumb, leave this fader alone. Leave this fader alone. And this is where you're going to add your effects and inserts. And again, I don't put a lot of effects on my master track, uh, my master channel here. It's, uh, you can, you know, again, that's what's so awesome about digital recording is you can experiment 
any way you want. You know, you can put master effects here. You can put your reverbs. Uh, usually what I'll do on my master channel is I'll put a limiter. Um, and we'll get into what limiting is uh, further downstream here. But uh, for now, um, rule of thumb is leave it alone. We just leave our uh, set at 0 dB. We want it set at 0 dB. So when you see this start to overload and turn red, and it'll give me a sign up here when that happens, that means that there's clipping occurring. So that means if there's going to be audio distortion on your track added, and if you're listening to it, it can make your speakers malfunction and make popping sounds and all that. And... Uh, we don't want that, so leave this at zero. So now we come over here to our main track here, and I'm going to close out some of these other things we don't need to look at. And so now here again, we're set at zero, and I'm going to put in a f uh, go over some three different effects: equalization, compression, and reverb. <coughs> and I'm going to stick with uh, PreSonus plugins for this again, because if you decide that you like the software program and you become a Sphere member, you're going to get all these and uh, what I'm finding, too, and because these are all new versions, you know, PreSonus has done a great job with Studio 1.5 of uh, revamping all their plugins. And they compete with any third-party plugin, third-party plugin that exists. And uh, just to give you an example, what's a third-party plugin? Um, <coughs> so if it's, I'm using PreSonus. So anything, you know, it's, anything that's not made by PreSonus, I would refer to as a third-party plugin. It's not made by PreSonus. Waves is amazing. So I have a ton of Waves plugins. Um, and again, they have uh, everything under the sun. A lot of professional studios uh, in L.A., Nashville, New York are, are using Wave plugins. And for good reason, because they are incredible. Uh, so, But we are going to use PreSonus, because PreSonus now, to me, makes professional-level plugins. And so the big three, you know, we're going through here, it's like, man, that's a lot of mixing plugins. Well, you're right. There's all kinds of cool cool tools you can use. But the big three are going to be EQing. So I'm going to pull up the Pro EQ, which is right here. And again, as I keep talking about... Um, switch to the full game. You know, I keep going on and on about how easy it is to use PreSonus. Well, that's gonna, I'm gonna about to give you a good example of, you know, one of the features that makes it so easy to use and why it's so fun for, you know, a musician who would consider themselves, you know, like a novice engineer or producer. And uh, I use those words interchangeably, but basically an audio engineer is someone who's trained at using this audio equipment to get recordings. A producer is kind of a, a catch-all term. A lot of times a producer isn't the audio engineer. The producer sets up a session. They get the musicians involved. Maybe they help the artists with the, you know, pick different tracks. Um, so there is a, there's a difference, a big difference between a producer and an audio engineer. Uh, so when I say an engineer, I mean the, the guy or gal sitting behind uh, they know, the mixer, plugging in the mic, setting up the microphones, you know, doing all that stuff. <coughs> so why this makes it fun for the musician who is a novice engineer is going to be what I'm about to show you. And so like I said, okay, uh, the big three I want. I want an EQ, I want a, a, a compressor, and I want some reverb. So I come over to Pro EQ, and instead of having to open up another channel and routing this channel into that channel, which you have to do in a lot of traditional... Uh, software programs or like an old school analog mixing back in the reel to reel days, you know, where you had this huge outboard console. These units, this reverb unit, the Pro EQ, would be a hardware box. So you'd have to route from that into a channel and blah, 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 blah. blah. So there's a lot of routing on this. I'm like, I want a Pro EQ. Drag it over to my inserts, meaning it's going to insert it on the channel. Bam. There's my Pro EQ. All set up, ready to go. By default, <coughs> I just have it. This is the company default. It's just flat. Nothing's, you know, nothing. And so this is my equalizer. And uh, we'll just start. <coughs> and, okay, so up here, this is important to know, this little pin here looks like a thumbtack. It is. It's a pin. When you turn that on, that means you can now change screens, and this will stay up. If I did have that turned off, when you change screens, it disappears, and you got to click on it again to get it to come back. But I want to show you. So now i got the EQ. So what is EQing? <coughs> equalization. And this is where we're going to uh, adjust the levels of the frequencies in our recording. And so when I hit play, and I'm going to set up a loop, and when I, when I set up a loop, 
a loop is exactly what it means. It's like I pencil in, okay, so now I engage my loop, my loop is on, and now it's going to loop over and over again between this point and this point. So we can just keep going and I can keep talking for you. So now we see in our EQ, and what I love about the Pro EQ 2 is it's very visual. So we're seeing this is what exists right now in the EQ. We can see that this is our bass frequencies, which are the heaviest. Down here are the high frequencies, which seem to be the lowest on the acoustic guitar. And so, <clears throat> and now we're going to see what a loop does. It's going to hit that loop point, and it's going to, without me doing anything, start over again. Um, so what I'm looking at now is, uh, you know, there's all kinds of different theories. And you can Google search uh, master class on EQing. And some of the best mix artists in the world, you know, give wonderful classes. If you're a PreSona Sphere member, they have the Learn section and the Sphere setup that uh, uh, a couple of their engineers go through and just do beautiful jobs teaching you a master class on that. So, again, I'm just going to give you my philosophy and just a basic introduction, and you can just run with it from there. Because, what, again, what's so great about um, digital editing like this is it's what's called non-destructive. I mean, I can make all kinds of changes, but it's not doing anything destructive, meaning changing this waveform. So that means I can undo all the stuff I want. So if I'm not sure if it's going to sound good, it doesn't matter because I can just control Z and it goes back to start. Whereas in the old analog days, once you did the mix and committed it to tape, well, it's like you had to go back, delete it, or load up a new tape, you know. <clears throat> so, again, we're looking at, um, uh, so basically it's either adding or subtracting volume of the frequencies. And I tend to be more of a, a subtractor, you know, meaning that if I want more bass, I don't immediately want to turn up the bass. I might want to reduce other frequencies that can be detracting from me hearing the bass, you know, maybe bring down the highs a little bit so that the bass is more prevalent. Or vice versa, if I want more highs, I don't just want to turn up the high end. I, you know, first thing I'm going to do is adjust my mid and low frequencies so they're not overpowering my high frequencies. <clears throat> Uh, so we can either add gain to the frequency or reduce gain. And so this is what I love about the Pro EQ is it's a very, um, I mean, it's a very detailed mixer. So we got all these different frequencies, and I'm not the best person to ask about the different frequency ranges, you know. So uh, forgive my ignorance on that. It, that'll be something you'll have to figure out on your own. I can't tell you like this is what 3K sounds like. I'm not that guy. I just I'm an experimenter. I just like to turn knobs until I hear what I like. So let's just go through some of the... So right now, I can visually see my bass right here is nice and fat. And that's good. I wanted my acoustic guitar to have some bass. <clears throat> so this LC means low cut. So I'm going to engage it. And immediately we see this curve. So now all the frequencies above this curve are no longer being heard. With without. Kind of hard to tell in the way we have the mix set up, but um, I'm going to actually change our loop. Okay, so now we're hearing more bottom end, and then I put the low cut on, and it's going to cut out all these lower frequencies. So these here are no longer being heard in the mix, only here. And now I don't want to completely cut out all the bass. So in my low cut, and basically meaning it's, gonna, it's literally cutting the frequencies, I can adjust. See that? Cutting all those frequencies. And then pretty much nothing. I like it about right here. Still nice and full, but that bass isn't overpowering the mix. And then we can come over here. And so now we have individual controls. And see, this EQ just gives you so much. And again, over here, you got your high cut. It's doing the same thing, but with our high frequencies. Now it's not cutting anything. And now we can see it's cutting out our bees down here. But we want those. those we can tell this sounds muddy. Now it doesn't. 
you know, one thing I want to say too is what's great about applying a low cut and a high cut filter is there's stuff going on over here, over here even, that uh, non-musical sounds, trucks rumbling by, uh, a fan running, the washer and dryer going upstairs. Even though we can't hear it, it's still being picked up by the microphone and impacting the recording. So when you put a low-cut filter on and filter out all this low stuff that's really below human hearing, well, then you know it's, you know, because the speakers are going to pick that stuff up too. So those kind of rumbles and stuff, even though we can't hear it in the instrument or human hearing, it's going to affect our speakers too. So that's, you know, uh, when your recording sound muddy, a lot of times it's because you haven't filtered out frequencies that are causing problems and could be adding sounds to your mix that, you know, again, you're not even aware of. So putting a low cut filter on, now all, the, you know, this is all my rumble, you know, this is the washing machine going, you know, this is someone walking around upstairs. And the same thing with the high frequency, you know, maybe somebody, you know, like I said, you're using a condenser microphone and we're not in the ideal studio conditions. And that's what this program is for. This is for uh, us home recording enthusiasts, enthusiasts who don't have the ideal conditions. Um, could be someone upstairs running a vacuum, someone outside running a weed eater or something, kind of thing, you know. We're going to filter all that stuff out. So, again, just because we can't hear it over here doesn't mean it's not being recorded and affecting our speakers and the playback and everything. So we just put on these low-cut and high-cut filters. Gets rid of all the crap. So now we're dealing with the frequencies that I think, you know, make up the mix. And so mid-frequencies we can see what those sound like. I actually like the way it sounds neutral. High frequencies there again. Kind of. I like that. Getting a little bit more of the strum and brightness to it. Excuse me. A little fuller in the high frequencies there. I'm just exaggerating so you can hear. Here's it cut out. Just a little bump. Now you can also take these dots and you can move them. <clears throat> and then, so this is the frequency, so it's moving the dot. And the Q, <clears throat> meaning it's uh, easier to see on this one. Now see how that line's going from real big arc? Now we're doing some fine precision mixing. You know, uh, precision EQing there. So it's going to... Now it's just that, one, that little, little crappy frequency I don't like there. And then see it widening out. That's the cue. I'll turn that back down. Good. And again, if something's sounding a little too muddy, instead of, uh, you know, we come over here to our low mids. That's mud. <clears throat> you know, that's it's making it harder to hear the lows and the highs. So we can see just a slight reduction and even a more precision reduction in certain areas. And see what's great about this visual aspect is I can see where they're peeking at. And just grab those. And again, it gets a little bit more clear. Now we're fine tuning it. <clears throat> So yeah, so that's what an EQ does. And again, there's so many like in-depth EQ mastering classes. I don't, I don't feel the need to do that. Not right now. That's we're not there yet. We don't need that. Um, again, there's people that uh, can speak more intelligently about each frequency uh, than I can. So again, that's I, I'm a knob twister. I love the fact that I can just keep twisting knobs until uh, I get the sound that I want. Uh, so I'll just give you general overviews, and then you can start twisting knobs, too. <clears throat> so that's what an EQ does. And we could hear how very quickly we were able to make the, the bass frequencies sound more focused. We still had that nice full sound, but it wasn't too bassy in the bottom end, kind of drowning out some of the detail of the mids and the highs. And then we tweaked those highs so we could hear a little bit more of the picking and the strumming as well. And we got, I think, a very nice, balanced uh, acoustic guitar sound. 
uh, with one microphone, one condenser microphone placed, you know, six to ten inches, whatever, off the sound hole at an angle. <coughs> And uh, again, what did we do to make that recording a success right off the bat? New strings or decent strings, and then we tuned the guitar. You know, tuning that guitar, make sure your guitar's in tune. You'd be surprised. Even some some good artists will come in and maybe they're intimidated, you know, being in the studio for the first time, you know, or they're paying by the hour, so they're watching their watching the clock kind of thing, and they'll forget to tune their instrument. So as a professional engineer. You know, that's something that you always want to, uh, you know, encourage them to do. Oh, hey, you know what? We're going to do another take. Why don't you tune up real quick? I'll give you guys five minutes. Tune up, you know, and just encourage them to do that. Because, yes, we can go in the mix using um, tuning software and fix bad notes and tune a guitar. But you just don't want to have to do that extra work, especially if they're, your buddy's not paying you to do it. <laughs> you know, so. so now let's get into the second um major important uh, plug-in uh, for this one. And I'm going to use reverb. Let's go into some reverb because people love reverb. I love reverb. And uh, it's also probably one of the most abused effects as well. <clears throat> and so reverb is going to be your sense of space. You know, when you get into like a gymnasium or a racquetball court and you clap and it's like... Tch -tch 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 -tch. I'm going to show you by just putting some reverb on my vocal here what I mean by reverb. Um, so I select my channel. I'm going to crank that up so I have reverb set so it should start to a little bit of reverb. Empty hall. Hey, everybody. Oh, there we go. This is Trevor teaching to an empty gymnasium because all the kids are remote learning. So that's reverb. So it went from no reverb. This is what the room sounds like. This is the microphone, you know, three inches from my mouth. Then we want to make it sound like there's a sense of space. And now we want to make it sound like a Pink Floyd album. album. Nice. So that's reverb. And, <clears throat> you know, reverb is going to give, um, again, that sense of uh, uh, a larger sense of space on an instrument. It's going to give it a smoother sound. Um, and so let's go ahead and add some reverb to our acoustic guitar here. Let me, I forgot to change it. Let's go back to our desktop view here so we got our EQ going and now we're gonna pull up our reverb and for reverb you know I usually don't use the PreSonus reverb plugin um, but in keeping with my let's use all PreSonus stuff I'm gonna find out which I think open air is uh, the reason I don't use PreSonus, it's not, we'll just use this re uh, room reverb. And so again, just drag and drop. I drag it over onto the channel I want, boom, pops right up. Um, this company, East West, makes a convolution reverb I am absolutely in love with. And uh, so I, that's just my go-to. But I'm excited. I've never used this one before, so I'm going to gonna use it today. And uh, so let's start our track going. As, and as a default, it looks like it's... Uh, See, we're looking here. This is the room size. Um, and as we change, the room gets bigger. The width of the room gets wider. The height of the room gets taller. Cool. Uh, so let's go ahead and hit play. So this is no reverb, and I'm here at the mix. <clears throat> and when I say, you know, I'm looking at the mix, this is how much of the effect, in this case, this is how much of the room reverb is being applied to our track. And right now we have 0%, so we can't hear anything. This is 100%, so now we're hearing all the reverb. Rarely are you going to want to go with that. Okay, and one thing I'm noticing, like, that uh, the playback on the acoustic guitar is uh, kind of quiet. So I'm going to come over to my EQ, <coughs> and you'll see here gain. So this is going to turn the entire volume of the track up. And instead of doing it here on my, uh, on my fader, because I'm already set at zero, I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to turn it up on my reverb. Or on my EQ, I'm sorry. So we can hear it getting louder. So now we can see in the plugin that it's uh, it's not clipping, but it's it's nice full sound. And 
so we come over to our reverb and we want to give it a sense of space you know it's like we don't want to make it we don't want it to sound like we were recording in our bedroom or a basement we want to make it sound like we were recording it in Carnegie Hall so now we got a nice reverb going <clears throat> makes it sound a little bit bigger length how long it's going to ring out And you can hear it's starting to get muddy because there's so much reverb. And again, this is where a reverb can be abused. Now, one thing I love about these programs, too, is like, okay, so I come up here where it said default. Click that. Now I got all these different types of presets, they're called. So somebody who knows what they're doing went through and made all these different ideal reverb, uh, reverb settings. And so I'm going to choose, I mean, it sounds funny, public bathroom. But a lot of times a public bathroom or a bathroom in general, what's great about bathroom reverb is that uh, it's common to have a lot of tile. And tile is just a wonderful source of reverb. That's why if you read like, uh, the making of albums, which I'm obsessed with doing. You know, A lot of times you hear about uh, Jimmy Page putting his uh, guitar amplifier in the bathroom and sticking a microphone like close to the toilet, You know, getting all these different uh, reflections. Why do people love to sing in the shower? Why do we always sound good singing in the shower? Because a lot of times we have all that tile reverb, you know, and it just makes our voice sound bigger and smoother and professionally produced. You know, we all sound good singing in the shower. Not so much in your car, because cars don't have a lot of natural reverb. They have soft surfaces, and so you get a very dry sound. So let's hear what that sounds like. We got a uh, public bathroom. So we're done. So now we're getting that fuller sound. And as you can see, we can change it. Flat plate. Factory hall. Good. So that's just the ins and outs of reverb. And again, it's <clears throat> it's usually going to be to taste. It just depends on what kind of uh, what kind of sound you're going for. You know. Uh, but on your acoustic instruments, drum sets, uh, basically every you know everything can get reverb added to it, um, even just to smooth things out. So that is our reverb. And the third effect that I was talking about is going to be compression. So we come to the compressor, just drag it in there. And now this is also going to be important. And I'm going to switch back here. If we look over here, I know it's kind of hard to see, is that the order that they're in matters. So right now, it's going into the EQ, then into the reverb, then into the compressor, meaning that that compressor is also compressing the reverb and the EQ. A lot of times, I don't want to... Um, I don't want the compressor affecting the reverb because sometimes it's going to change the impact of frequencies. And so I want the purest sound to be interacting uh, with my compressor. So, uh, and again, what a compressor does, a uh, compressor is basically, and while I was raving about the, uh, the PreSonus mixer having built-in compression, is that uh, it, it prevents signals from going over a certain decibel level that you set it at. It can be the entire track or it can be, be certain frequencies that you set. I don't want them going above uh, two decibels in the bass. So you set the frequency. So as soon as that um, the gain on your track hits that decibel level and tries to go above it, the compressor engages it and brings it back down to the level that you've set it at. And then you can set how fast it does that and how fast it releases that signal. But it's basically going to keep, you know, um, your tracks from, from, I mean, in a general sense, overloading. But there's so much more you can do with compressors. And so let's take a look at that. How are we doing on time? You doing good? Yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah. <coughs> So the compressor. Again, it's just set to default. And I actually want to turn off the reverb. And 
So now we're seeing right here, the compressor's not doing anything because where I have it set at, the signal isn't going above the threshold that I've set. So if I come over here, like the ratio, I'll explain this some of the threshold. As you see we move that, that is the threshold of where the signal, if it's going to go, if it goes above this, the compressor will engage. This is, so we add to our threshold, setting where the compressor is going to engage. Ratio is how many decibels it's going to compress that signal. So 2 to 1 means for every decibel it goes over, it's going to compress it by 2. And we got 5, you know, there's all kinds of different ratios. I like, um, just for our example's sake, I'm going to set it 2 to 1. So it goes over by a decibel, it compresses it 2. Attack is how fast it's going to attack, basically how fast it's going to compress the signal. And then the release is how quickly it's going to disengage the compressor, you know. And uh, it can either be set, when it's set a little bit higher, that means it's going to back it off slower. And if it's real quick, that means as, so as soon as it's, boom, it's just off. <clears throat> Makeup gain is going to be the amount of that you turn the track up after the compressor is engaged. And then for a compressor, I like to turn the mix up so that you're hearing the compression 100% in your mix. So let's go ahead and hit play. So again, we're not doing anything with our compressor yet, but let's change that threshold. Here, getting quieter. And we can see that yellow is how much is being compressed. Not doing anything. Now it's compressing. Two to one. So without, and we can see that little line there. Bring it so it's more dramatic. With. That. Compressed, uncompressed. Good. <clears throat> so that makes sense. So now, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is um, I do want to, in today's session, yeah, we're really going. This is good. I want to get into the difference in sound between two microphones on the acoustic guitar so we can see the difference and then I want to get into uh, I don't think we're gonna get into beat making today that's gonna be in class three that, that we need an entire class for that because one that's like my most requested is beat making and <clears throat> we're already, you know we're already into an hour and a half in this session so we'll just do next week next Saturday will be all about beat making and that'll be fun so what I'm gonna do now <clears throat> is go ahead and set up my new microphone set up so I'm going to turn off the phantom power so I can unplug this microphone safely turn it down <clears throat> and we'll set that aside and we'll get out the pencil condensers <clears throat> and while we do while we do that I'm going to open up another file so we can have some background music. What do we want? Something chill. Yeah, it's chill. <coughs> Excuse me. Just a track I've been working on. There, so now we have something gently playing in the background. <coughs> I said gently. There we go. So now I'm going to set up my pencil condensers, which I have over here. <coughs> pull up, make sure I got the right screen on. I do, yay. <coughs> SC Electronics, SC8s. So remember, this is a small diaphragm condenser. <coughs> and again, it's going to require phantom power. <clears throat> comes in this nice kit comes with a stereo bar for stereo placement I don't need that 
uh, for recording an acoustic. <clears throat> I use that more for drum overheads or overheads on like a string quartet or something like that. And they also come with uh, small diaphragm uh, condenser mic, the mic clips, which we'll need. <clears throat> and so now I'm going to take these off my two little mic stands here. And again, with a condenser mic, with any microphone, you want to be careful, but doubly so with the uh, with the condenser microphone because those diaphragms are so sensitive. You know, you drop it once, and it's I mean, they're pretty much junk at that point. You know, they're just, they break. And again, it comes with the, the Rode NT1 set comes with its shock mount. And so I'll need two microphone stands for this. And this is my uh, Shure SM57 dynamic microphone. You can use that to record an acoustic guitar. It's just uh, it's just not going to give you the most detail. Uh, that mic, uh, the SM57, is my go-to for a snare drum, or congas, <clears throat> or over top on a djembe. For that, they, uh, <clears throat> I really don't think they can be beat. Okay, so now <clears throat> the idea when we're setting up these uh, pencil condensers is going to be. these mic clips on there. It's going to be about, uh, I'll show you where we're going to position these. So it's again going to be about getting one microphone aimed at the sound hole. And then we're going to put the other one aiming more at the neck. So we're going to get um, more of the fingering sound and just a little bit, um, you know, more bright, bright sound coming out of that because you're not getting all of the uh, bass being pushed out of the sound hole. So again, get our mics. And what's nice on these too is we have uh, filters built into them and also you can reduce the decibels either by 10 or 20 dB and it's called a pad. So when you see on a mixer or on a microphone a pad, that means it's going to reduce the power to it so it brings it down by 10 or 20 decibels, which is great. So if you're trying to mic a louder instrument, uh, maybe even you got them going over top of a drum set and they're, it's just too loud, well, try the 10 decibel pad or even more extreme, a 20 decibel pad. And then you can also put in a low cut filter. You can keep it normal or you can put in a 80K or a or an 80 hertz or a 160. I'm just going to leave them neutral. Now it doesn't matter what way the mic's twisted. I, I mean I have this thing where I just like to see the labels but actually on these because I might want to make switches I put it so I can get at the uh, my filters and pads on them when I'm setting them up. And then I need two microphone cables, which I happen to have right here. And so again, just to review, the side with the three prongs goes into the microphone preamp, and I'm going to stick this one in channel four. Both of these mics are going to require phantom power, but I'm going to leave that off for now because uh, until I have them plugged in. So this has basically become a master class on acoustic guitar recording. <laughs> That's good because everything we're doing to the acoustic guitar just applies in general, you know, to an audio signal as well. And so then we plug our mics in in a smaller space, try and uh, remain uh, tangle free. Good luck. Okay, so all my mics are set the way I like them. And this is kind of a, that's the only hassle of being your own engineer when you're also the player. 
is it now you kind of gotta without <laughs> without scratching and so I'm just gonna and now you can use the stereo bar on this some people would you know that bar I had in there and so you kind of but I prefer the independence of being able to uh, move them around on stands to get them where I like them and so this one plays towards the back coming at the F hole and again this one's gonna get more of our neck neck sound like that okay so we'll put those there and now that I have the mics properly plugged in I can go ahead and engage the phantom power which on this one mixer on the L12 it's just a single button so now both my mics are getting phantom power set the gain there Make sure my effects are off, yes, because I don't want to record that. Okay, so let's see what happens. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, yeah. When people do mic checks, too, I mean, it's okay to gently tap. You don't want to be thwacking them, but don't blow into them, either. Blowing into a microphone is no bueno. Okay. So we can close this track right now get back to okay so again this first time we recorded the acoustic it was a large diaphragm condenser and um, where's it going with that oh okay so it's a mono track so now what I'm gonna have to do is insert two mono tracks one and two and this is where it's gonna get tricky actually you know what I we aren't going to do this. I'm sorry, folks. We're not going to. Because of the way I have things set up, I don't know how I will. Uh, no, no, it won't work. Yeah, because I have this mixer going into that. It's going to make it <coughs> very complicated. I guess, you know, what What could I do? Nothing. I'll have to figure that out. Okay, so anyway, <coughs> we're not going to get an audio example of this today because of the routing conundrum I have going on. But uh, essentially, <coughs> we know what we can still hear it coming through there. I'm just not getting the uh, the stereo that I want because the, this mixer is going into the one and two. So, but essentially now, <coughs> you still we're seeing nice full sound, but we get a lot of the. I'll go ahead and record that, <coughs> even though it's not going to give me what I want because it's going to record it both. Anyway, I just want to do show you. Now this is where things are going to get weird, and I have to do some pre-planning. So, anyway, <coughs> that's good. So that is the second technique for miking an acoustic guitar: using pencil condensers. Again, you got one coming at your sound hole off center. Second one's going to get your neck. <coughs> And it's going to give you uh, a little more fuller sound, and it's going to capture some more of the finger noises. And uh, a lot of guitar players like that <coughs> as well. And it's going to get some of the more high frequencies because it's not getting all the bass coming out of the sound hole. And then you're going to have two tracks. And uh, I do want to show you next week uh, the difference that that makes. But just uh, right now, because of the way I have things going, it's just not, not capable of doing that. So that's good. That's good. We've uh, we've covered a lot today. So, you know, again, this is kind of an informal, you know, the home studio at home in my studio, just kind of showing you some of the ins and outs. And uh, if you have questions, <coughs> um, you can go ahead and uh, I'll change my screen here. Oh, there we go. There I am. You can go ahead and just reach out to me. Let me know. Say, hey, Trev, I'm working on recording this sound source. You know, how do I do this or that? And uh, again, I'm designing this more for the person who's never really um, recorded themselves before and uh, just is something maybe looking to take on as a hobby. And uh, it's like, well, hey, I got GarageBand, and I just kind of thought it'd be fun to record some of my acoustic guitar songs I've been working on during quarantine. Well, that's great, and that's what I'm here to help you do. So, yeah, again, my name's Trevor Meyer, co-founder and CEO of Warrior Beat. And uh, next week, what we're going to be talking about, again, is going to be... Um, doing the two I'm going to figure out how to route that 
And then we're going to get into beat making because beat making is another uh, recording uh, method that people keep reaching out saying, hey, I want to learn how to make some my own beats. And uh, I'm definitely an expert at that and we'll be happy to share that knowledge with you. So I hope everyone is enjoying this. Again, uh, 